Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So I am here with Grandmaster Alex Lenderman, Brooklyn Zone, um, one of the top players in the U.S. Alex, thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's a great pleasure. I've got a lot of things I want to talk about with with you, um, but I wanted to start with one of the more recent things you've been a part of. We also had Grandmaster Sam Shanklin from the U.S. Olympiad team, but you were the coach. And I first thing I wanted to do was clarify the difference between the coach and the captain in the Olympiad. Uh, well, uh, the captain is uh, the person who, first of all, will take uh, care of most of the technical things like uh, like you know the hotels uh, well, what nights are paid for and which ones are not or the times like everyone is arriving you know these kind of technical things and making sure that everyone is set if they want to come earlier and uh, so on and so forth also the captain's role was uh, in, in case someone would get sick you know or they would you know um need some kind of like they would want a snack you know the captain would um, give uh, the players that during the game or or you know during the day you know if it's like medicine or something also some players you know had some preferences of some kind of uh, nutrition during the tournament um, th- during the day which they didn't always have an opportunity to eat in the restaurants so you know John Donaldson would buy them this kind of food, um, you know, when he had time, and especially in the morning. So basically, he took care of all things like that. And of course, he would make the lineups. He would take care of the technical stuff at the Olympiad. He would uh, try to make sure that he would encourage the players and so on and so forth. So he did all that stuff. Whereas my job was pretty much only to focus on the purely chess things, preparation, and most of the opening preparation and stuff like that. Okay, and how did you end up being the coach for the Olympiad team? Well, uh, in the U.S., the the way the the way the coach is selected is by the players voting. So, um, I applied for the position to be a coach for the U.S. team, and uh, basically I was uh, voted in by the players. It was actually a very close vote, but in the end, uh, I got the very close nod. Okay. Well, it, it seems like it, it turned out to be a good choice. Uh, so did you have a relationship with the, the players that were on the team? Do you think that helped you get selected? Well, uh, not, not, the, not, a very, not a very long-term or very close relationship. But, um, well, actually, what happened was one of the players, the reason I even applied for the job, like I, originally I wasn't even going to apply for this job because I thought this is going to be a very tough, responsible job and I didn't really want to want to have this responsibility of working the player. So what if I make a mistake It would, and then because of me, you know, the, the, the players would not get the result that they wanted. I would be heartbroken. But one of the players asked me to apply for the job. He really wanted me um at the job, he really wanted me there because, uh, you know, this player thought that I would be a good fit for for him, and uh, I played a few practice blitz games with him, and he kind of appreciated that. I don't necessarily want to mention who that is. I mean, maybe some people could guess. Maybe, maybe this person wouldn't want me to mention that. But, uh, but basically, um, he he vote he was the one who voted me in, um, and. Uh, and actually, he was the only person who vo- voted for me in the first time. But the thing was that um, no one got more than two votes from 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 any of the players. So since no one got more than two votes, that means it's two votes is still not a majority. So they had to vote again, and they had to also put in second place votes and uh, third place votes and stuff like that. And uh, one of the players, as far as I know, switched his vote from someone else to me i'm not sure exactly who that was but i have a good guess but i'm not 100 percent sure and then so in the end i got two votes and um 
Daniel Narodutsky got two votes, and uh, and then uh, and then, but I got more second place votes, so that's how uh, I got in. Okay. And how long did this process take? Was it all done in a day, or was it like you were sitting waiting for weeks to find out if it was going to be you? It was weeks uh, because I applied in the very end of May, right after the U.S. Championship, and uh, I mean, and then. Then after that, uh, I waited for like at least, uh, I think almost a month, if not a month, because yeah, it was a complicated selection because it involved, you know, people voting, having to vote again. It was, it was quite complicated. And uh, I remember I was playing the qualifier for, qualifier for the World Cup in El Salvador. And in the middle of the tournament, I was told that I was selected. And I was not even sure what to do. I mean, I, I was a little bit surprised, to be honest, that I was selected. I still didn't didn't really expect that I'm, I'm going to be the one selected, but I still have to focus on my tournament and really consider all my options. And then in, after the tournament, I realized that, okay, since I was selected and since people asked me ahead of time to go, then, okay, it's meant to be. I probably should go. You know what I mean? So I... I, I went. Yeah, I don't think a lot of pa- chess players would pass up the opportunity to do something like that. Um, did you have experience uh, coaching elite players? No, never, n- whatsoever. And that's also why I was a little bit uh, not sure about either even applying or then taking the job. But okay, I felt like it was uh, all the circumstances played in a way that I I should I should do it. Uh, I, I mean, everyone told me I should do it. It, it just became clear that I I just didn't want to, you know. Uh, I just didn't want to um, make that decision purely on my own because of my own ego. I wanted to make sure that it's really the right decision for everybody and pretty much pretty much almost everybody will be happy with it. And that's why I, w- I wanted to make sure that I, I even speak with some players who didn't vote for me and see if they didn't really mind. But they, they were okay with me also and uh, I mean, so I decided to, to go. Okay, so once you decided to go, what was your next step? How do how do you begin to prepare to be the coach for an Olympia team? Well, that was something that I took very very seriously. Uh, obviously, there is a, I, I already knew in advance that there was a limited amount of things that I can do simply because I feel like all of the players who play there are super professionals, and I think that they all have, or at least had at that moment, better opening preparation than I could. So. There's only very little I can do, so I, start, I started working very hard. I, I started to ask some of the players, what do you want me to work on? Are there any specific lines, specific variations you really want me to analyze deeply? And some players gave me the list. So with some players, I did a little bit of work before the tournament. I also <clears throat> took a few lessons with the GM to make sure that I also have some ideas from him. So. Basically, I tried to do everything in my own power to make sure that I do the best possible job that, that, that I can do. And also, I made sure that I come earlier there to make sure I get a chance to work with some of the players. And uh, because I think that during the tournament, there's really a limited amount of things that I can do because mostly at the top level, people surprise each other all the time anyway. So you pretty much have to be ready with a lot of general stuff. And very often, you can't really prepare very concretely during the tournament. It's actually quite qu- very difficult. So which is why I thought most of m- most of the things that I can help with is actually before the tournament. Okay. And you you mentioned you took lessons from a GM. I know you've worked with GM really in the past. Was it with your regular trainer or did you uh, seek someone else out? Well, with Georgi Kachashvili, I've been working for s- over seven years and I still work with him. He's my main coach. But um, no, I, I took lessons from from another GM, like around 10 less 10 hours. And uh, it was it's actually he's actually quite a famous theoretician. Um, He mostly teaches kids now these days. But uh, I again, I probably shouldn't mention that because I'm not sure if he he would want me to mention that. But uh, he's actually worked with a lot of top elite players in the past, um, before he worked with me. So I I knew that, you know, at least uh, I'll get some very high insights. It's free publicity. I doubt he would be too upset, but I understand if you okay, want. Okay, it's uh, it's Boris Avru. Okay, and did did you find uh, the instruction to be uh, uh, helpful? Yes, I mean it was it was good. I felt like Boris did the best he could, uh, and he prepared well for the lessons, and uh, I enjoyed working with him quite a lot. There's 
there are quite a few things that I learned from him and some of the things were helpful. So it was definitely worth the try. Okay. And being up close with, uh, you know, we had three players in the, the world top 10 and two more in the top 100. Seeing how these players work up close, did that have an impact on how you prepare and approach chess uh, for your own play? I think it was more or less what I expected. Um, I think uh, the, the really top players, most of their preparation that they do is, is before the tournament anyway. And during the tournament, some of the players maybe sometimes even have a more relaxed approach and they just want to make sure that they're in optimal form and uh, because with most of the things they're already more or less well prepared i mean they of course look at concrete stuff during the tournament but i think that they're not super reliant on preparation during the tournament i think preparation in order to be a top player you have to do a lot of preparation before the tournament okay and just uh, a couple more things on the Olympiad. So as the tournament went on, what would you do during the rounds? Are you watching every move? Um, are you feeling very emotionally invested in the results? Um, well, basically, uh, my plan was this. Um, I, 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 whenever the players would need me, I would always be there for them. So whether it's staying up until 12, 1, 2, doesn't matter. I mean, I would, I would stay up as long as it's needed in order to get my work done. And also I would get as early as possible, like 8, 9 a.m. to make sure that I start working with the players. So I would try to reserve the, the time when they play the round to get a nap so that I have the good uh, free energy. But I know that towards the end of the tournament, when they were playing the really decisive games, I couldn't sleep anymore. I was very, very nervous about the results. So uh, in the beginning, it was okay. But towards the end, when I knew that we had a great chance for the gold, it was uh, very tough to sleep. Okay. And did uh, the players get together and celebrate when they finally won? I mean, it, they were a very group, a very happy group. But also, I think a lot of it was relief because uh, the tie breaks in the end were very, very complicated. And it was very fortunate that we were the one who ended up getting gold. And... Um, you know, I think they were all very tired and uh, everyone celebrated in a different way. I'm sure most of the players celebrated more even when they got, got back. But, yeah, I mean, uh, they were definitely very, very happy uh, as far as I could see. So no champagne sprayed on each other like in. Uh... No, not that, I, not that I saw at least. <laughs> OK. Um, so did this uh, experience make you more inclined to do more training of uh, top players? Actually, I would say quite the opposite, to be quite honest, because uh, I found it very stressful towards the end. And there was another moment which I thought, w which was very difficult for me, and I actually knew going into it that it would be difficult, but uh, somehow I managed to kind of like go around it. It was basically, you know, it's probably no secret that um, the top players are all very competitive with each other. They play each other at the U.S. Championships. And if you speak about the top three players, they play each other at Super Elite events. So obviously, they don't really necessarily want preparation to be shared. So I had to sometimes jiggle my way out of it. Like, I would have to share one... I would have to show one person one idea, but, like, not quite exactly the same as, you know, I showed the other person. So, you know what I mean? It, it was... That was a little bit of a tricky part because some of the players, of course, didn't necessarily want uh, concrete preparation to be shared. And I had to find this balancing act. Like I had to ask some players in advance what could be shared, what can't be shared. And that was, I felt, the stressful part. And also, of course, just in general, you know, uh, the responsibility, how one mis misanalysis uh, could really play a crucial part. And um, that's... Uh, a stressful part and not to mention towards the end of the tournament so i mean i didn't really like i said i didn't really even want to do that that's not something that i was i was ever interested in the only reason i did it is because certain circumstances just showed me that yeah i should do it this time but and it worked out great but in general it's not necessarily something that it's uh, that i feel like it's my cup of tea if you know what i mean i i feel like it's uh, too stressful and too responsible of a job for me but of course if i get if a bunch of players really ask me to go, then I'll I'll consider it. If they really really want me badly, then that's another story. But for me to you know apply again from my own will, that would be something that I'm not sure if I would do. You're gonna make them beg, huh? <laughs> well, not 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 beg, but I mean I feel like you know 
I, f- I feel like for me personally, it's 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 not something that I would really super want to do, but I, but I don't mind doing it. I mean, if if the players, if if I feel like I can really help the players, uh, and they really want me rather than someone else, then that's that's one thing. But to do it from my own ego, that's not something that I would be very very interested in. If you know what I mean. Okay, and what about from a financial perspective? Is it like a, a game changer in terms of uh, your income as a chess professional, or just just another job? Oh uh, well, it's not it's not life changing by any means, but they paid pretty well. Uh, I mean, so I earned a decent amount from this thing, but it's not life changing. I feel like. More life changing might be just the fact that I got the reputation of winning the gold once, and uh, that might be very good for me in the long run to try to get students. You know, if I ever switch into coaching, so that I feel like that's more of an important factor than actually the how much I got paid during the the event. Okay, yeah, I and I want to talk about playing versus coaching, but one more question on the Olympiad. For that, so in terms of all the preparation that you helped the players with, how much did you end up seeing on on the board in the games? Well, <laughs> yeah, there was this one moment when uh, uh, when actually I was not happy with what I saw to some extent. Actually, I'm one of these people that I I usually get nervous when you know I see something that I've shown and that that's been played because I'm always worried if I've shown it completely and actually there was one moment where I was where I was really upset with the job I, d- I did now later on I was told that it was, it was that I didn't really do anything wrong but I feel like I could have maybe did my job a little bit better and that was when Sam Shankland played against the uh, uh, Indian Grandmaster Sita Roman and uh, Sam Shankland played um, one of my ideas that I that I showed uh, it was actually not completely my idea, but it was. I got it from another GM originally, but it was. Um, I I I was the one who showed it, but unfortunately, I I I failed to analyze some of opponents' like potential not best replies, and uh, un- unfortunately for me, uh, Seth Roman played one of the like not the most critical lines, and Sam was better, but he had to find a very precise continuation, which. Which you know, it's not so obvious unless you know the line specifically. And unfor- and I was really hoping that he'll find it anyway, but unfortunately he didn't. And uh, and then he almost lost this game. And I would have been very, but luckily for me, he won the game and we won the match. And he came came back. Uh, you know, he made a miracle comeback from a lost position in that game. You know, he has great fighting spirit, but uh, but I would have been heartbreak broken had. Um, had you know, um, had had Sam you know lost this game, or and especially if we would have lost that match or not win the match against India, so that was a nervous moment for me, uh, certainly. Was that the game where he was like minus nine on the engine? At one? Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yes, that was that was incredible. And he should have you know been much better out of the opening, but he played in precisely, and uh, I, f- I felt like maybe I was a little bit to blame for that. I mean, I guess I, it's hard for me to cover everything, but I feel like maybe you know maybe it's a little bit on me, and I was a little bit. During the time, during during the moment, I was really, really worried. Please find this. Please find the idea. I mean, I was very worried. And um, and after that, I realized, yeah, it might not be for me. <laughs> yeah, it does sound nerve wracking. So you meant you suggested a minute ago that your your emphasis is sort of more on playing at this point than coaching. Um, so how do you how do you structure your time? If, um, on a daily basis. Yeah, well, uh, I try to um, do, you know, at least an hour a day on physical form and uh, roughly four or five hours a day on uh, chest training. And uh, I try to be a universal player, so I try to work on all aspects of my game. But, of course, the weight is, has to be on openings because that's... Uh, that's probably the most important area these days in chess. So if you because if you don't have good preparation, then it's hard to you know be very confident, unless you're a very natural creative player in general. But but otherwise, it's it's very important to have preparation that you have faith in because that if you know what you're doing in the opening and you know the plans and stuff like that, it's you, it's much you know you get much more confident when you play chess and. Confidence is, is huge at the 
at this level. That makes sense. And you've been, uh, you travel a fair amount. I notice uh, more so than any other guest I have, you're pretty active on the U.S. circuit and you, you travel to play. So how do you decide which tournaments to, to play in? Well, uh, I, I, you know, I, I look at the, I look at several factors. First of all, I look at the financial aspect. I see what the first prize is. And if the first prize is very good, then, you know, that means that, you know, the tournament's probably going to be very strong. So naturally, I'll get a chance to play some very strong players. And, um, you know, also maybe a good chance to win, you know, a good amount of money. That's that's one aspect. Another aspect is whether I get uh, some kind of conditions, whether it's hotel paid for or maybe even an appearance fee. Depends on the tournament, of course. But, of course, I look at that factor. Like, for example, I considered playing Gibraltar, but since um, it was so strong that, you know, of course, it, you know, they couldn't really give a player like me conditions anymore. And then it would be a very expensive tournament, something like $2,000 at the very minimum. And uh, it's very, very hard to win, obviously, given how strong it is. And I feel like I've played so much last year, and I feel like I'm not in my optimal form yet. So a tournament like Gibraltar, I would only play if I feel very, very confident about my chess. But cer certain other tournaments I can play um, regardless. You know what I mean? So uh, sometimes I also want to play tournaments when I feel like I'm getting rusty or I feel like I want to get uh, some good games in. And also, I try to play in Europe when I can combine it maybe with another tournament in Europe because I don't really like to go to one European tournament and then going back. It's I feel like, you know, with the jet lag, it just um, becomes not so convenient. So I feel like if I want to go to Europe, I want to make it two or three events and preferably not completely back to back, but at least maybe a few days rest in between. So there are a lot of factors, but... Uh, this year I'm going to be even more selective because I feel like last year I've played a little bit too much and towards the end of the year my results kind of suffered. I felt like maybe a little bit even mentally tired and draining, maybe a little bit tired and drained from playing so much chess and also when your results are not quite the way you want them to be, it's it's also can, can basically uh, uh, carry over and uh, be unpleasant. So... This year, I decided that I'm gonna play, try to play less, but try to play, I try to make sure I'm always in my best form and try to play more, you know, more more effectively. And which uh, which tournaments do you have on the horizon currently? Actually, nothing that I nothing really planned very big until maybe maybe May or something like that. There's nothing really nothing really major. As, as far as I know for me. So just work, work, work in the meantime? Yes. I mean, I decided that I'm going to, you know, work very hard, uh, harder than I ever had. And uh, because I've also the the downfall of playing a lot is that you don't really get a chance to get on that routine, whether it's physical shape or chess routine. It's just the playing kind of is distracting in a way. So I feel like I should play when I'm, you know, totally ready and... Uh, when I when I'm able to reach my maximum results, because otherwise it gets quite pointless. Uh, and what do you do for exercise? Well, I walk sometimes, maybe a little bit running, and uh, also uh, fitness. So go to the gym. So uh, you know, weight training or uh, just using machines. So just gym and uh, walking, running, th things like that. Okay, and with uh, such a long hiatus in between tournaments and not doing a lot of coaching, is it is it hard to make a living for you? Well, actually, I don't really look at playing chess right now as you know a good way to make a living to begin with. My goal is I want to try to at least have a chance to become a, an elite player, or at least something that resembles that. So something like 2,700 feet there above, 2,750 feet there above. Um, something along the, these lines because as a 2600 player tournament player there's not much you can do to make money and um, I, I, I mean I've saved up enough thanks to uh, you know making some money at the US Championship the Millionaire uh, some coaching here and there the Sanford Fellowship so I'm pretty well off now I mean I I, I feel I mean I'm, I'm not struggling to survive or anything like that I mean so um, I feel like I want to invest as much as I can into my chest to try to 
reach the the next level. And if I can't, then I should probably in a year or two switch into coaching because uh, there's like, basically not very much point of playing chess professionally, like purely playing chess professionally, unless you're at the very least top 100 player in the world, probably even higher. Well, good for you. It's It's good to... I think the listeners and myself, like, you know, it's a lot of people listening probably can't imagine being even as as good as you are at chess. So I think it's uh, it's inspiring that you're still doing the work and still trying to push harder because I know it's uh, it's you're swimming with sharks. <laughs> well, actually, if, if I wasn't trying to get better anymore, I would have already switched to coaching full time by now because it's really not completely unpractical living in the U.S. and trying to make a living off of just playing chess at my 2600 level. There's just really no point um, because uh, 2600 doesn't really even get you to the US Championship or not to mention, you know, playing at the Olympia, the World Team Championships or any kind of good tournaments. And uh, even the small tournaments where the first prize is a thousand or two thousand dollars, even those tournaments are hard to win because there are always going to be a few GMs playing. And um, it's gotten much more competitive than it have, ever has before, especially in the U.S. And uh, all these tournaments that used to be much easier to win, now there are a lot of these strong college students who play. And uh, in general, it's gotten much, much, much more competitive. And, um, yeah, it's unrealistic to try to actually make a good living or because someday I want to be able to support a family, my own family, uh, not just myself, but my own family. And... Uh, for that, of course, what I'm making now is not going to be enough. I'll need to either coach full time, or um, or I would have to be an elite player, like uh, 2750 feet there and above. And right now, I still feel like I have a slight chance of, you know, becoming elite because I feel like I haven't really exercised all my opportunities yet, all my options. But once I feel like it's pretty much definitely not in the cards, then I think I should just switch into coaching because that's that's only a practical thing to do. So the reason I'm even still playing chess actively is because I have a goal to get better. But of course, if I figured I'm only going to be 2600 for the rest of my life, then I would have switched to coaching a couple of years ago, maybe, or even five years ago. Who knows? So that's that's the idea. Okay. So what do you mean when you say that you haven't exercised all of your options? Is there you you haven't put the time in or what what is uh what is left to be done i feel like i've played quite a lot in the last year or two and that's not really been very effective for me so i i've never really took let's like four five six months off to just train very very hard and really work like a horse i feel like i've never really done that even when i've trained in the past maybe i've trained a little bit softly and i haven't really forced my brain to really really work like you know i feel like there are two types of studying there's like two types of training there is lazy kind of training passive training and active training and i feel like active training is doing tough puzzles you know or maybe playing tournaments or even playing games um uh, friendly games with, with strong players, training games, or it could be r- trying to analyze a variation, but without too much reliance on the computer, but really trying to put your brain in. This is active training. And passive training is, let's say, watching a video or, let's say, um, playing Blitz. You know, that's something that's maybe more like passive training, where you don't really put your brain that much into work if, if you if you see what i mean and i think in the past i mean i've always done a lot of chess but maybe or maybe looking at some games uh, top level games just like very breezing through that's also passive training so maybe in the past i've done way too much passive training and not enough active training and this year my new year's resolution is to try to do more active training and be more disciplined with my sleep with my eat with my uh, diet with everything and uh, and really not feel sorry for myself, but really give it all out uh, in order to invest into myself. And I feel like that's not something that I really did ever. I mean, maybe I've never really put the heart in completely into into chess. And I feel like that's very very important to do. So deliberate, more deliberate practice. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned the U.S. Championships. I was trying to research and figure out has the field for this year been announced yet? Well, uh, I. Th- I well, I don't think it was announced, but um, I 
I mean, I don't think it was actually officially announced, but as far as I know, I, I'm not playing. So that's 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 uh, that I'm pretty sure about because uh, I think the players already got their invitations early in uh, January, and I think that by now, if I would have gotten a wild card, they would have uh, told me. So I'm pretty sure that. Uh, uh, I'm not going to be invited. Okay, yeah, it looked like you were right at the cusp. Not really. I feel, I've actually I've played so badly last year that I've actually fallen behind quite a bit. So um, there are actually, even if I think one or two players would have declined, I think I still would not make it in by rating. So, I mean, basically after some of my bad play in the summer, I pretty much already realized that I'm not going to get in by rating, and uh, um, which is fine. I mean, actually... It's okay. I mean, whatever happens, I feel like always happens for the best. U.S. Championship would have been a very tough tournament for me to prepare. And uh, right now, my goal is, again, to just get better in general. And uh, maybe you, as good of a tournament as it is, it might have been also a distraction because then I would have had to focus specifically and uh, on that one tournament instead of preparing in general. So I always try to look at the positive side. So I'm not I'm not disappointed. I feel like... Um, I feel like I've, I haven't deserved to play because I played badly last year, and uh, my goal is to play well this year um, when I do play and uh, to get better and uh, hopefully make a leap in my chess ability. Okay, well, it sounds like a good perspective. I, I was a little disappointed when I looked at the, looked down the list, but then again, there's there's so many strong players. It's, it's got much more competitive, and uh, as soon as you know you play not your best chess, you know you can get eaten alive by this competition, and that's why you have to always be hungry and always try to try to improve. Otherwise, you get worse. Actually, it's not like you, because the thing in chess is if you don't if you don't actually get better, if you don't work at your chess, it's not like you stay the same place. You get worse. That's something that's important to remember. So uh, that's with that in mind, it's it's even harder because. You can be improving your your level, but you can be improving at the same level as, let's say, chess in general is improving. Because chess itself is improving every day. Computers are getting stronger. People are getting more access to more information. And it's, you know, other people around my level, they're also constantly improving. So in order to make a leap, it's not that I just have to improve. I actually have to improve more at a more steady pace than the people around my level. So that's, I think, the toughest part. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, switching to a bit of a light, lighter subject, you 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 live in Brooklyn, grew up in Brooklyn. It's a place special in my heart. I lived there for for 10 years. Uh so do you consider you you mentioned uh, we've talked about finances a little bit. Do you consider ever living somewhere cheaper in order to to make uh being a chess pro more viable or is New York too dear to you? Well, I, I live with my with my parents and uh, I, I try to support them. So I oh, feel wow. like it's better for me to invest money into them rather than pay some guy who I don't know some rent, a thousand dollars. It's better than if I just help my parents. So I feel like it's just not very practical for me. I mean, I'm used to everything in New York. I have some of my close friends here, my parents. It just doesn't really make very much sense for me unless I unless there's some golden opportunity for me somewhere else, which is just something that I can't pass, I feel like it's not, doesn't make sense. And plus, for teaching chess, I think New York is very good because in Manhattan, there are a lot of young kids who could afford expensive private lessons, if you put it that way. And, um, you know, so it's, you know, it's, 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 you know, most, most, if, if you're a good coach and living in New York, you most likely you're going to be able to find some good jobs for coaching and uh, like I said I feel like it's quite pointless to become 2600 and and being a pro unless I want to live somewhere maybe outside the US and um, unless I was a chess fanatic but I feel like I do enjoy teaching chess and I feel like unless I can help help impact the US community like whether it's playing the US championships or helping some of the top players or or maybe even playing on the Olympiad or stuff like that I feel like if I'm just a 2600 journeyman player and playing all the time from tournament to tournament, it just, I feel like there's not that much point to my lifestyle. I don't even help anyone else. I barely help myself. It's just, uh, there's, I just don't see a a big point behind that. So, um, I would rather at least, if I can't become good enough to help chess at the, at the big level, then at least 
I want to be able to help uh, the kids get better, hopefully. Okay. The new generation. And I know your uh, your junior high coach, uh, Mike Klein, mentioned that your dad was very, very involved in your chess as as a youth. So I'm sure you're you're happy to pay it back a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And he's still somewhat involved. I mean, he still follows my games. He still follows my progress. He still is very worried about my results all the time. Sometimes a little bit too much for my liking. Right. That's how sometimes uh, parents are. But it's... Uh, you know, it's it's not that bad. I mean, uh, uh, I'm an adult now, so I, I I deal with it. And is he a chess player, your dad? Well, yeah. I mean, he's not a he's not actually a, he doesn't play in tournaments, but he definitely understands chess. I think his understanding is quite a lot better than actually his playing ability because he doesn't have the patience to play, but uh, or especially long games. But I think he he understands chess at a decent club level, maybe somewhere around between 1600 and 2000 is what my guess would be so um he definitely understands chess so that's uh that's good i mean that's quite good if he's never played a tournament and he's 1600 to 2000 well he is he would play he, i mean he 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 did chess when he was in in ukraine soviet union so okay and is your fam where in the soviet union is your family from the former soviet union okay so my father is from Ukraine and my mother is from St. Petersburg. Okay. And do you ever get back there? Uh, I went back there once for a tournament, but uh, I think uh, all of most of my relatives are have immigrated whether it's to US or to Germany or Canada or all over the map basically. So Okay. And you were part of the legendary Edward R. Murrow program which has a lot of uh, Russian um, Russian and other uh, foreign players could you talk about that experience a little bit yeah edward armora was was uh was unique uh it was a good school um and i of course i got in there because of chess and uh mr weiss was a was a great coach uh very very nice person i still i still see him from time to time and uh, st- we still are in very good terms we still have nice conversations um yeah, the the team was quite strong. It was uh, me and then a, another very strong player, uh, Sal Bursis, who, uh, when when he was uh, already quite strong when he came from Lithuania to our school, that was like a bolt from the blue, like it came out of the blue. That Sal Bursis also came joined our school, and that was a great blessing for us, of course. And he was already around twenty three hundred USCF when he joined, and when he graduated. He, he was around, I, I think he was already an IM. So, and he's still an IM. He went to UTD. So we have basically two 2400s, more or less, in the last three years. And we also had a bunch of, you know, players, maybe between 1500 and 1900. So we had uh, two very strong players for high school standards, of course, uh, along with a bunch of also very capable players. So, that's why we would always be one of the favorites to win the nationals. Yeah, and you've had uh, there's a lot of other famous chess alums, as it were, Irina Crush and Justice Williams, and in my generation. Oh uh, wait a second, Justice Williams. I didn't think that Justice Williams went tomorrow. I'm, I might be mistaken, but I thought that he went to another school. Uh oh, uh oh, got to get our fact checkers again. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, I'm don't... pretty sure it was it was it was uh, James Black. I think. Okay, my mistake. Um, but anyway, a lot of other famous players. Um, so what's the, uh, did you feel like you were, uh, benefiting from the curriculum there? To be honest, I, I, I barely ever went to the after school chess club. So, uh, I would usually, if I would go to something after school, I would go to a math, uh, after school because, uh, I think the the program was good, but I've never really got a chance to see it very much. I think it's more it was more designed for players um, uh, under two thousand or maybe even you know sometimes under a thousand. So for more, I mean Elliot Weiss is a very nice person, but he's an eighteen hundred player, something like that. So I didn't really see very much point, and he didn't really make me go or ask me to go or anything like that to the after school. I, I don't I don't think sell. So went to after school either i mean i was basically more or less self-trained i i had coaching uh until i was 15 years old and after that i kind of 
self-trained. I played a lot, so I I didn't really see very much point of going. But it's no disrespect to Elliot Weiss, of course. It's just um, the program was not really designed for 2400 players, obviously. Right. Although maybe maybe now that I look back at it, maybe I should have went at least a few times and maybe helped some younger players out and some lower rate players out. But back then I was a different kind of person and I was mostly thinking only about myself and uh, I uh, that didn't didn't really occur to me, unfortunately. But uh, that's something maybe I would have liked to take back. So what what has changed that that makes you? Uh I feel like you have a different uh, mindset now. Well, basically, I think until I was 19 years old, I was a completely different kind of person in general. I was a, I was quite antisocial. I uh, uh, I would often get into little conflicts with player, people for no good reason. I really was obsessed with money too much. I mean, I was I, I had a different outlook on life back then. You know, before I was like before I met Georgi Kachishvili in 2009. And then my outlook on life and my outlook on chess gradually changed because I realized that the way he lives his life is quite unique. And I realized that uh, it's quite completely different, actually, than I, something that I've ever seen from anyone else. And uh, I really got attached to him. Um, and uh, he also liked me quite a lot, even though he heard a lot of bad things about me. And that's something I also appreciated about him because he did not judge the cover by its did not judge the book by its cover, by a reputation. He saw some good things in me which other people weren't able to ever see in the chess world. And um, and he was a Christian, and uh, and that was really uh, and and that and the fact that he was such a nice person also made me convert into Christianity in uh, in in a year basically because I saw that the way he lives his life is just so much unique to compared to what I've ever seen from anyone else. So, And I also took upon his a lot of the things that he does. I mean, I realized that he doesn't really get obsessed with money. I realized how good he is socially, how he avoids conflicts. It's just a new, it was like a fresh new outlook on life that something I've never seen before. And uh, ever since, I've uh, I've been able to start realizing what I'm doing wrong and start seeing my mistakes in my approach and help little by little, you know, I've, I've tried to really work on becoming a better person. Whereas in the past I never did. So that was, that was, uh, the fact that I met Georgia was a huge blessing for me, both for my chess and more importantly, I think for my, for my, for my personality. Wow. That is quite an endorsement. There are a couple other topics I want to hit Alex, and then I will uh, let you go. Um, you, like a lot of our recent guests, you're you're busy in the Pro Chess League. How is uh, how's your team doing? The team's doing pretty well. Uh, we have uh, three out of four. We won three matches. We lost the heartbreaker the last match. We missed some opportunities, but uh, including myself. But it happens. You know, everyone goes through uh, tough losses from time to time, and um, hopefully. We'll play this Saturday and we'll bounce back and play a great match. Okay, and are you doing much training for those games, much preparation? Yes, I definitely take that seriously because I'm playing for the team and I want to make sure I give it all, all the best I can. So I absolutely, I definitely do preparation and I try to make sure that I, I'm in my best form for these matches. Okay, and one other topic I wanted to talk about. Normally, since a podcast is not the best medium for talking about individual chess games or openings, but I just had to mention this game that you played against Simon Williams in London. And I don't know, I don't know if you've seen it, but Simon uh, did a quick video of it. Um, you, uh, you, on YouTube, you played a, a positional peace sacrifice. Do you, do you want to just give people the broad strokes of that game in a, in a way that without get, getting into specific moves? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, that's, it's, it's, uh, I definitely watched the video. It was quite a cool video. I mean, I've been told about it by a few people. And actually, Simon himself told me that the, the very next day that he did, did a video about that game. But actually, the funny thing I want to mention about it is that uh, even though the, the peace sack was a very nice idea and all that, but actually, my execution was actually not very accurate of that peace sacrifice. I should have done it in a slightly different move order and then it would have been much, much more effective and it probably would have almost won the game right away. Whereas the way I did it was it actually still gave Simon a chance, a few chances to really come back in the game and still make a draw. And uh, I miscalculated 
a few things a little bit. And that I was a little bit disappointed with. But of course, I was very happy that I found the idea, even if the execution wasn't perfect. And I feel like, to be honest, I think Simon praised me a little bit too much in that game because I didn't think that that game was as good as he made it look. And in fact, I think that uh, Simon played the game quite well up until a point very creatively. There were some ideas that I underestimated and I feel like he had a he had a much better position at some point than he, I think he gave himself credit for in, in that video. So um, actually, uh, it was a very good battle. It was a very great pleasure for me to play a game with him. And in fact, the last time I played Simon, I lost to him in a rapid game quite badly. I mean, he played a great game. I didn't play so well, but um, you know, I had a lot of respect for for Simon as a chess player and especially as a as a chess ambassador. I think I know that he does a lot of YouTube videos and a lot of live commentary. I'm a very big fan of a lot of it, pretty much his work on online on chess.com and stuff like that. I really like his uh, energetic approach. I think he, he I think he's very very good for for the chess fans. And it was a great pleasure for me to play a game with him. Yeah, he is. He is an entertaining guy. Uh, I a couple questions on that game. So number one, um, when I looked at it, when I I, I had seen Simon's video, but then I looked at it with the engine uh, this morning, just a little bit. Now, when an en- when you make a positional piece sacrifice like that, the engine briefly still said that you were worse. Is that? Is, do you find that to be accurate or no? No, I was. Uh, I checked it carefully. I, w- I was never worse after the peace sacrifice. And in fact, I planned this peace sacrifice even I think a move or two before when I when I went for a certain continuation. I don't re- remember exactly the moves, but basically, I knew that I can't be. I, I knew that I'm at least not risking losing. I saw a, a lot of the lines where um, you know I'm I'm definitely not worse. So. No, I'm pretty sure I checked it careful. I'm pretty sure I was never actually worse there, but uh, who knows? I mean, maybe maybe you checked it more carefully than I did. But no, I'm, no. <laughs> I'm almost I'm I'm almost certain that I uh, by that point I was never worse. I might have been a little bit worse earlier earlier in the game. That's that's different. But I think once I sacked the piece, I think he had a chance to uh, make a draw, perhaps. But I thought that I always had a practical advantage, even even with my incorrect execution okay yeah by no means that i mean to suggest that i went over the game with a fine tooth comb i was more curious generally about uh when an engine like if you make a positional sacrifice an engine just i feel like a, a player like you is better able to answer for me like how how accurate is the judgment that it makes oh uh, well i think it depends on what depth the engine was at if the if the depth is like let's say less than 20 then it might still not uh, realize certain moments, but uh, I think uh, if you leave it on for like at least 15, 20 seconds, I think it'll, uh, you know, it will realize it. It's something that it actually might not see in advance sometimes, these position sacrifices, but um, once you give it some time to think, then it will see. It. So it just depends on how long you leave it on for. I mean, of course, there are certain, certain, certain ideas that the computer, no, long, no matter how long you let it think for, it will not see it. And I think actually I watched Veselin Topalov's uh, master class um, for Gibraltar, and he gave some example, something similar to that. So I can refer some of you who are interested in positional sacrifices, and, and in general, a very nice interview and a very good lecture to Veselin Topalov's master class for Gibraltar. I think it was on chess.com, it was on chess24.com, it was also on the Gibraltar website. I think you can watch that. But in general, um, yeah, sometimes there maybe there are like one percent of positions where the computer still is not as good as a human. But I would say for the most part, computers have gotten quite good that you know they they see pretty much all sorts of things by now usually, except for maybe fortresses. I mean, fortresses sometimes they misevaluate the positions and they give very high evaluations when there's a fortress. But besides besides that, I think computers have gotten very very good okay and and one last thing uh related to that game is the the question of uh intuition versus calculation so when when you play an idea like that how how much is it based on concrete analysis versus just like feeling like it can't be 
you know, you can't lose if you play it. Oh, uh, well, no, I definitely had to calculate some variations, but I realized that he can't really get this bishop very easily back uh, to guard my pawn, and if he, if he can't really get the bishop, then it's hard for him. And I started calculating a few variations, and, you know, in every line, you know, it was kind of working in my favor, and, uh, and then I had to just trust myself. Um, you know, normally when you see a promising continuation and you don't see a good reputation, you have to trust yourself. And even if somehow it happens to be there, well, then you might have missed something brilliant, but that's fine. I mean, you know, we're all human. We all miss things and that's okay. I mean, the key is not to be afraid of going for something that you kind of know that you kind of feel is the right idea. So, of course, some calculation is involved, but at some point, you know, you can't calculate absolutely everything and you kind of have to just trust yourself and uh, realize that you cannot be perfect with your calculation because we're all humans. And we all will make mistakes no matter how hard we try. So, um, you know, just accepting that sometimes we can make a mistake is sometimes good to just try to cut down on your ego and uh, not expect to be perfect absolutely every time. Yeah, Sam, Sam Shanklin gave similar uh, practical advice when, when I had the pleasure of interviewing him. Uh, I just want to wrap up and do a couple sort of lighthearted, lighthearted uh, rapid fire questions. Number one is we had a question from a podcast listener by the name of Greg S who asked who was the first IM that you beat in a tournament and how lucky did you get? First IM who I beat in a tournament game. So uh, does that count ra rapid or does it count uh, only classical time control? I suspect it counts rapid knowing Greg S. Okay. I, I think, Oh, Greg Shahade. Oh, <laughs> uh, Oh, it's Greg Shahade. Oh, okay. Uh, well, actually, I think it was in his tournament. It was in the uh, New York Masters back when he still was running New York Masters. And uh, I'm, as far as I remember, it was actually not Jay Bonin who, for most kids, it was Jay Bonin who was the first I am who they beat. For me, it was uh, I am Justin Sarkar. And I'm pretty sure it was a back and forth game. I don't remember all the specifics, but I, I don't remember if I really got very lucky, but I remember it got very complicated in the end game and somehow I... I, I definitely know I won on position, but I, I, as far as I remember, it was quite a complex game, but I don't really remember anything else about it. It was uh, I was around 13 years old, oh, and wow. I was maybe close to master, but uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was a nice win for me. Okay, I assume the subtext of Greg's question was that he thinks that he was the first IM that you beat in a tournament, so I don't um, know. Um, no, I, I, I mean... Uh, yeah, I definitely remember now that I did beat Greg, but I, I'm pretty sure my win against Justin came first. Uh, I, I, I mean, I definitely beat Greg before I beat Jay, because I remember I beat Jay only like when I was already 2250 UCF and only when I was already 14 years old. And uh, I, Justin and Greg I beat when I was 13. So uh, I think I even might have beaten Grandmaster Alex Strapunski before I beat Jay, which is quite unique but uh uh yeah i think no i i don't think it was greg i think it was close but i think it was justin sarker who came first but that's that's something that i guess you could you know that it could be checked on ushs.org slash msa and look at my 2002 history i'm, I'm pretty sure it came in 2002 so um uh, that's uh that's the year probably, okay. or maybe, or maybe early 2003. That's around the year. If if someone's very interested, they could check and uh, know exactly. The important thing is that you beat Greg. It's less important when. Yeah, actually, the Greg game was nicer. I mean, actually, it was bad. It was a bad game. I remember I hung a pawn in the opening, and uh, I uh, I played the opening very badly. But then somehow I found some freak sacrifice, and I had a nice attack, and somehow I won. I mean, I, I don't remember it very well, but I remember it was a King's Indian. It's, that's something I played back then, and somehow I think maybe Greg relaxed a little bit early once he got this winning position, and somehow I got a, an attack out of nowhere. Okay. Another question that I would be remiss if I, remiss if I didn't ask you, uh, and I haven't seen the Lenderman dance in a while. Is there any chance of it reappearing? I mean, uh, it's probably mostly retired, but maybe if I win the U.S. Championship someday, it's, I mean... I, I'm, uh, but but then of course you see the problem with the Lenderman dance is that usually I would only do it if I win a big tournament. But then how would the other players feel about it? So that I would just like show them off. So I mean it would have to be something where none of the players mind. Like if every player wants me to do that, and uh, you know the organizers, everyone wants me to do that, then then maybe. But uh, other th otherwise, I don't know. I I feel like. Uh, 
it will it will, it will be a little bit awkward. Okay. I mean, I think it goes without saying everyone would want you to do it. You don't have to do it at the board. You know, you can. Oh, obviously not at the board. <laughs> I mean, obviously it would be outside somewhere. I mean, right. well after the tournament. But again, that would be have to be something that you know I don't I don't want any players to be uncomfortable, especially if I've beaten them in a tournament or something like that. <laughs> okay. Uh, last question, Alex. What do you do when you're not when you're not doing anything chess related? How do you relax? Uh, well, uh, how do I relax? I like to walk. I think physical shape sometimes helps me relax. That's a distraction from my chest. And uh, also praying is a, a good method for me. Um, and sometimes I, I'm guilty a little bit of watching a little bit too much TV. I feel like I have to break that habit if I want to have a better chance of becoming elite. But uh, uh, yeah, I guess that's that's mainly it. I mean, sometimes I want to socialize with some of my friends. But um, and I go to church on a regular basis on Saturday evening and Sunday morning when I'm not at the tournament. So that's of course it's very important for me to do spiritual stuff as well because otherwise um i mean if i become a chess fanatic without anything else then uh, that might be bad for my my psychic you know what i mean so as as committed as i am for chess i think it's important to also be well balanced in other areas so um so that you know you're not uh, so that so that you know if something doesn't work with chess that you don't go crazy i don't want to mention names of course but <laughs> i think i think you can guess who i might be talking about <laughs> okay all right alex well listen i really appreciate uh you're coming on here if uh if any fans want to get in touch with you uh can they and how should they oh absolutely i i'm uh, i'm on facebook my name is uh alexander lenderman um and uh also by email i can i can i can i guess uh I don't know if it's public to anyone my my email, but uh, should should I give it? Yeah, uh, it's up to you. I mean, people can find you on Facebook. Uh, I mean, I, I haven't gotten any bad feedback about people being uh, stalked or anything. So well, I think uh, okay. My email is Alex Lenderman, so A L E X. Then Lenderman, like my last name, no spaces in between. Then thirty three three three, Jesus Christ number, uh, at hotmail dot com. So Alex Lenderman thirty three at hotmail.com okay sounds good Alex thanks a lot for doing this good luck with everything good luck in uh, your, your chess boot camp coming up in the next few months your intense training thank you very much and thank you very much for doing this interview with me it was a great pleasure for me to talk to you thanks for listening to Perpetual Chess to hear more episodes give feedback or suggest guests go to perpetualchesspod.com if you like the show please help me out by telling your friends and giving me a high rating on iTunes I'll be back next week with another episode of the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Podcast.